and friends good evening and welcome to the wednesday evening webinar of the indian college of anesthesiology well we are progressing through our webinar and we are trying to educate everyone around us with more knowledge and probably matters of future and today's webinar is one such sort and we are discussing the global scenario or say the forthcoming challenges in anesthesia and today's main speaker and the moderator is dr mugul chandra kapoor who is a professor and head of the institute at amrita institute of medical sciences faridabad delhi and is ably aided by his colleagues at the institution dr rakhi and dr shalu and they are discussing something which is new to all of you including me and i am sure this will be of interest for our future and this will be the future of anesthesia or future of medical science in the coming years and i request mugul to open the topic and start the webinar and you all know that our conference going to be from 4 to 6 now and it will be held at government medical college chandigarh most probably next week same day a prelude to the conference will be run by the conference organizers and i request all of you to attend the session and you may be able to know more about chandigarh and what is in conference for you and what is you want to know from the organizers and i request mugul to go ahead thank you very much uh, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present this webinar to this august audience and to the students <clears throat> who are taking part in this webinar uh, to start with this uh, we are talking about forthcoming challenges in anesthesiology and what are things going to likely to be in the near future what challenges are going to come up so we have divided this webinar into three parts the first talk part will be uh, dealt with by dr shalu garg and she'll be talking about global issues in in general the global issues which are coming and affecting healthcare in general and how they will further affect anesthesiology the second talk will be by dr rakhi and who's going to talk about the changing perspectives in anesthesiology how things are changing in anesthesiology and i'll be coming last and i'll be talking about what changes are taking place in anesthesia education and what things are recommended in future so that we have better trained anesthesiologists to to begin with this uh, with this webinar i would first like to invite dr shalu gar dr shalu gar is a professor of anesthesiology at um, the same institution in which i work that is amrita institute of medical sciences faridabad and uh, she has got a background from the armed forces she was in the uh, indian navy before this and uh, she thereafter worked in uh, max hospital in saket and uh, her primary interest is to teach and uh, she has uh, been on the faculty of fmc also and she has been conducting regular classes for dnb students and uh, so with, with a passion to teach i thought she was one of the right people one right person to present on global issues as it affects anesthesiology over to dr shalugar uh, thank you so much sir is my slide visible yes it is good evening everybody i bring warm regards from uh, amrita hospital at faridabad embrace good health is what we talk about there i am dr shalu and today i shall be dealing with global health issues in brief and uh, basically i will be focusing upon various health issues and how they impact the anesthesia 
practices of anesthesia and teaching of anesthesia. And thereafter, I will also mention about how the glo uh, global challenges are being faced by the fraternity of anesthesia. Before we proceed any further, uh, let us see what is the definition of health as defined by World Health Organization. We've all heard of this definition many a times, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. But the meaning of health has been evolving and it has evolved over time. So there are three possible definitions we can look into. Health is the absence of any disease or impairment. Health is a state that allows the individual to adequately cope up with all the demands of daily life. It also implies that there is absence of disease and impairment. And health is a state of balance and equilibrium that an individual has established within himself and between himself and his social and physical environment. If you look at this diagram, you will know that within the cultural and biosphere, it is the person who exists in his body, mind and spirit within his family. And this family is a part of the community and human made environment, which is affected by his work, his lifestyle and his medical system, which in turn look after his personal behavior, human biology, the psychosocial economic environment and the physical environment. Keeping this in mind, we proceed further to see what is the leading cause of death globally. This is the start statistics from world over, mostly from high income group. And as you can see that the ischemic heart disease takes the first priority, the highest uh, number of cases are seen of ischemic heart disease, followed by stroke. But if you notice over here, almost 60% in top 10 are infectious diseases. What are the statistics for the low income countries? It is slightly diff different here. You find that the infectious diseases take precedence. The neonatal conditions, mostly diarrheal diseases, lower respiratory tract infections, tuberculosis being a very common uh, uh, disease. HIV AIDS also, though it's on its way out, but still it has not lost its sting in the world. So we see at a selection of global health concerns and how these can mobilize the network to tackle the problems which we face. So here, if you see, there are various diseases, the non-communicable diseases, as well as communicable diseases. There are various risk factors like climate change, which is a very hot topic these days, industrial pollution, drug abuse and alcohol, tobacco, obesity. Then there are certain groups of people who are more vulnerable than the others, like the newborns, the pregnant women, adolescent females, prisoners, elderly we can have various interventions to tackle these diseases like immunization, family planning, literacy, especially female literacy, micronutrients, mosquito nets and condoms, which can take care of a lot of issues. What are the various systems which can be put to work? The workforce, you have to define the workforce and define tasks for them. Finance, this is the most important topic. Here we talk about the developed countries, how they can help the developing nations and the poorer nations. Information, dissemination of information and upkeep of latest in information. The universal health care, the private health care. And the last but not the effectiveness of all the in a delivery mode to the person. Communicable, non-communicable, malignancy, transplant and geriatric. So let us see what are the communicable diseases which trouble us the most, it's tuberculosis, malaria, various diarrheal diseases, and HIV AIDS. Of course, the latest entrant is the SARS-CoV-19. Influenza H1N1 is still quite prevalent, followed by dengue and hepatitis infections. If you see this, the disability-adjusted life years, diarrheal diseases are the most disabling, followed by tuberculosis. Amongst these, you can see the Hepatitis C, et cetera, almost thereafter, therefore causing more damage. Tuberculosis has a very high incidence in India. Similarly, malaria, a very high transmission in India too. So what are the concerns as anesthesiologists? As I go ahead in the slide, you may find that certain concerns are quite repetitive, but I will be highlighting the specific concerns with respect to various conditions. So for communicable diseases, there could be transmission of disease to the OT personnel, physiologists and all 
others, especially to work. In times, we have found how difficult underlying diseases like bronchiectasis, etc. Protection of OT staff has to be of utmost importance. Universal precautions, uh, aerosol precautions have to be taken. The patient's diseases could be exacerbated because of the uh, surgical stress. We have to take care of the perioperative care and perioperative complications. If you look at the non-communicable diseases, like I said, the maximum disease burden is that of ischemic heart disease. However, a lot of disabilities because of the back pain and other musculoskeletal disorders. So what would be the concerns for the anesthesiologist? We've all been tackling a lot of these patients in our uh, routine anesthesia practice. The ischemic heart disease, the uh, diabetic mellitus patient, the uh, thyroid diseases, etc. So preoperative optimization of the milieu is the most important thing which we all take care of. Without optimization, we really do not want to subject the patient to surgical stress because there could be exacerbation of the disease. Choice of anesthesia care and difficulty in anesthesia procedures is extremely important. We could have patients who will not tolerate general anesthesia or some other patients who have contraindication for regional anesthesia because of the various drugs which they are taking. There could be drug interactions per se. Patients could suffer critical adverse events like the major adverse cardiac events on table. Then perioperative care and complications remain the same. These patients could go into prolonged hospital care if the disease is not controlled well. Coming to the next aspect, the nutritional. As is obesity a problem, so also malnutrition. However, malnutrition as such does not lead to so much of an issue with respect to anesthesia, but obesity more specifically because of the comorbid conditions like diabetes, ischemic heart disease, their uh, size itself, making them move, positional changes, etc. choice of anesthesia care. General anesthesia is always a huge problem. Similarly, regional anesthesia, spinal anesthesia, epidural anesthesia itself could be a, a procedural challenge for the anesthesiologist. These patients, they could be having sleep apnea syndrome. They could be suffer from critical adverse events. Therefore, we have to be extremely careful about managing them in the perioperative period, postoperative period, probably requiring NIV in the postoperative period and of course, prolonged hospital care. The next is malignancy. We just cannot look away. If you look at the graph on this side, there are almost 2 million cases which were reported in 2020 alone, which included a lot of breast cancers and lung cancers, among so many others. And if you look at this graph on the right side, the patients, there was almost 50% mortality in the incidents reported. The highest, of course, was lung cancer, followed by colorectal, liver and stomach, and so on and so forth. So you could imagine what would be the challenges for us. We have increasing burden of cases because there are so many new cases. There are so many recurrences because of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, et cetera. So you may find that because of chemo and radiotherapy, there could be so many associated problems underlying. The patients could be on prolonged opioid uses, so you have to be very careful for their pain management perioperatively. Choice of anesthesia care and difficult procedures. As you can see in this figure, it's a difficult airway being tackled by an awake fiber optic intubation. India, we all know, has a very high incidence of uh, head and neck cancer, so we have a lot of problem. Nowadays, with further advances in surgery and chemotherapy, here you can see in this picture, a HIPEC is going on for an abdominal malignancy. These surgeries lead to a lot of metabolic and electrolyte disturbances perioperatively. So it's a very challenging situation for the anesthesiologist. There could be difficulty in procedures because of radiotherapy and certain uh, problems which could occur with the su subcutaneous tissues, etc. with radiotherapy, establishing lines, giving blocks, etc. Then caring for the critically ill and perioperative care because cancer is a disease which can have a lot of mental impact on the patients. They could land up with infections. There could be poor self-care. They could not care anymore if they also land up with depressive disorder. Very common with these patients and of course, post-op rehabilitation. The next is organ transplant. We all know that the number of organs being transplanted is going up by the day. The commonest being renal transplant. Liver is also not far behind. We have seen many liver transplants. Heart and lung also, especially lung transplant during COVID times, we saw the incidence was high. Bone marrow, yes. Limbs and face transplant is also happening. 
Now in our hospital also, our reconstructive surgeon has a lot of experience with limb transplant and we are just waiting to go ahead with limb transplant, upper limb, especially cornea. A very small, uh, special subset of patients in organ transplant are the organ donors. We do not, unfortunately, we do not have many people who are willing to donate the organs. So the concerns for anesthesiology, I will talk about organ donor a little while later. The concerns right now, again, is increasing burden of cases. Patients have better survival and outcome because of better immunosuppressive therapies. So a lot of post-transplant cases, post-renal, post-liver transplant cases come for surgeries other than transplant related. We have to perioperatively optimize them. Choice of anesthesia care has to be very carefully designed. The patients may have difficult procedures because of previous uh, uh, lines which have been placed in the central area, central line, et cetera, which could be thrombos. You could not find any central venous access probably. Then perioperative complications, most important infection because all these patients are on high dose of immunosuppressive therapies and prolonged care for the critically ill. The next is a very special subset, like I said, the organ donors. We could have organ donors who are brain dead and the family has consented to donate their organs or live related donors. The live related donors are also increasing in number, but we still find difficulty in uh, getting donors. Brain dead, again, a lot of awareness is required in the community for people to be willing to donate the organs. Again, there are more and more people coming forward to donate. Perioperative optimization, especially a brain dead donor. Once a donor is declared brain dead, a lot of uh, paperwork and a lot of uh, things are required to be done before the person is willing for, before the organs become available. All this while, the preservation of organ perfusion has to be maintained. The internal milieu has to be kept optimized till the organs are ultimately harvested. Margin of error is very low, either it's brain dead patient or live related because each and every organ is extremely precious. You have a relative who's uh, donating his kidney, his or her kidney, or a relative who's donating his or her liver. We just cannot go wrong with the live related donors. And similarly, the brain dead donors because the organs are extremely precious. Communication with the relatives has to be extremely compassionate. We have to take care of them extremely well. Geriatrics, this is one population where we, uh, whom we are encountering more and more in our practice. We have had plenty of nonagenarians coming for various kinds of surgeries. This is becoming a global health thing because Japan, et cetera, has longevity. The lifespan is almost 90 years and so also many other countries. In India also now people are living for much longer years. Because of improved medical care, there is longevity. The disease burden of course increases as you live longer. But diseases also have better survival and outcomes because of uh, better surgical skills and better drug availability. So the concern here remains the same, the perioperative optimization, the choice of care, the procedures. What is very important here is to take care of them perioperatively. A lot of these old patients, they go in for post-operative cognitive dysfunction, which can become extremely torturous to the patient as well as to the family. The care for the patient, their infections, self-care and post-op rehabilitation, where we may have to fall back a lot upon the relatives to be able to look after these patients, or at least a health which will take care of them. Next is occupational. We all know that because of the industries, there are a lot of lung diseases, interstitial lung diseases which are there. Air pollution is a major problem, rise in number of cases of asthma, COPD, etc., then the IT industry has given rise to a lot of sedentary population leading to obesity and various complications which arise because of sedentary habits per se and the musculoskeletal problems also, the cervical problems, etc. So the concerns are compromised pulmonary system, again, perioperative complications and a good rehabilitation, especially for patients who have a compromised uh, pulmonary system. War zone. This is something we thought that now the era of war is over, but we see a new war which is going on almost in the beginning of this uh, year. So what does war lead to? There is extensive destruction of infrastructure, extensive destruction of the existing whatever medical facility the particular country has. Therefore, it limits the access of the patients to the basic medical facility. Not to mention about Plenty of cases who suffer from trauma of various kinds. It could be bullet injuries, bomb injuries, mine injuries, etc. 
Transportation of critically ill patients, especially out of the war zone, can become a challenge. There are a lot of displacements happening for patients, people living in that area who want to run away to escape the war. And mental disorders and post-traumatic stress disorders are in a very, very high number. Our concerns are safety of the medical personnel is first and foremost. You can't just jump into a war zone and try to evacuate or treat a patient. We also have limited access to medical help. Our team itself could be very small, not uh, able to tackle all the casualties which occur. There could be very limited medical facility available. Availability of blood, surgical care, surgical disposables could be limited. Transportation of critically ill, like I said, could be a huge challenge. And continuation of care is a very big problem. If a person has to be evacuated from country A to country B, and he or she is critically ill, then that continuation of critical care across the countries is a very, very big challenge. Mental disorders, PTSD, like I said, it doesn't go away easily. We could be handling or seeing these patients for many years to come. Similarly, disaster management. Every other day we have disasters of various kinds striking some part of the world or the other. There are natural calamities like floods, drought, earthquakes or tsunami, man-made calamities like bombing, fire, vehicular accidents, including even aircraft accidents. And of course, climate change is responsible for all the natural calamities is what we get to hear. What would be our concern? Again, safety of medical personnel is the first and foremost dictum in any disaster management. You protect yourself first and don't, then only you go ahead to evacuate the patients. Again, there could be limited access to health. You could be in an unfamiliar surrounding so also the access to victim who is stuck in a very unfamiliar surrounding. I'm sure we all uh, remember the case of all those children who were stuck within a cave in Thailand and how difficult it was for the people to evacuate the victims because they did not know the anatomy of the caves. And then the critical care people were in, uh, called in to help handle those patients and then get them out in a suitable uh, manner. Triage and prioritization of patient care is a very, very very important aspect of disaster management. You cannot just go ahead and treat 100% of the cases. You need to triage and see which of the patients are salvageable, where your efforts are likely to uh, put, bring in results. You will need a large medical infrastructure with large capacity to be able to tackle a large number of casualties which happen at the same time. So also you will require a lot of medical personnel at the at a small time for tackling all these large number of casualties, be it doctors, be it the nursing technique assistants, be it the nurses, be it your housekeeping and general UP staff. Fatigue of medical personnel is again a very, very big issue because you may not have reinforcements come to you very soon. The nurses could be overstretched, the doctors could be overstretched and other infrastructure could also be overstretched tackling such a large number of casualties. Our concerns could be trauma, polytrauma, burns, difficult procedures, limitations of procedures. You may not be able to access the patient easily, but you may be required to start an IV line. You may be required to give some kind of resuscitation to the patient. All those could be highly limited. There could be high demands for blood, high needs for surgical and medical disposables. Again, as I said, transportation and continuation of care of the critically ill. The patients could have various diseases. The survivors also will have various diseases. As we saw during Bhuj earthquake also, we were tackling patients who had trauma, but then others who did not have trauma or were the survivors also fell sick because of uh, non-availability of uh, potable water, etc. Again, mental disorder, PTSD remains a common factor. Animal health and food sourcing are not directly related to anesthesiology concerns, but we all know food chain has to be maintained uh, meticulously for us to be able to source our food transport the food to various places, and especially to places who do not have access and prevention of zoonotic diseases. We've burnt our fingers with COVID-19 pandemic, which the world is still seeing. We still have no answers where this pandemic originated from. In the agriculture, we have to take care of the agriculture part because if food is not available and food is not distributed, other problems simultaneously will come in. Waste management I have mentioned, especially over here because the Burning of crops, etc., can lead to a lot of environmental pollution and a lot of pulmonary diseases. A quick review of the mental diseases. If you can see, these are the figures of India. 
maximum number of patients have depressive disorders, mental disorders, and anxiety disorders. There is a lot of uh, life years which are lost because of these depressive and anxiety disorders. Pandemic has caused a big spike in anxiety and depression. As you can see the figures from January 2019 to the uh, May 2020, and then the latter half of 2020. There has been a sharp increase in anxiety as well as depressive disorder amongst the world population. So the common conditions could be intoxication, harmful use of substances, dependence of various substances, withdrawal, delirium, psychotic, amnesic syndromes, and drug abuse. We as anesthesiologists have to be extremely aware of all the drug abuse, etc., so that whatever is the drug which the patient is taking, we should have good history because a lot of our anesthesia drugs have interactions with these drugs and we could do well to avoid them. We need to prevent the patients from causing further self-harm. Our choice of anesthesia has to be very meticulous. Drug interactions, like I said, we have to be very careful. Procedural difficulties could be there, especially if a patient is IV mainliner, we may have simple things like IV access could be extremely difficult for us. And then poor self-care and infection is known to happen in patients who have mental disorders. Therefore, post-op rehabilitation and somebody to care for them is very, very important. Now, a few slides to focus especially on global health. Uh, if you see this uh, statistics from United Nations, it says that half a billion people have been pushed into poverty because of the healthcare costs, especially in the pandemic in the last two years. And if you look at this second figure here, it will uh, speak about what I'm going to say the next. Eight times more boosters were administered globally in developed countries than primary doses in low-income countries. So that brings us to the most important challenge of global health, lack of equity in access to safe and effective medical care worldwide, lack of resources, economic and infrastructure. This is where the global health comes into picture. When I did a lot of search about global health, I uh, was taken to various departments of uh, various universities, especially in the United States of America. They have a well-running program about global health and global uh, they have fellowships in global health anesthesia where the fellows are uh, trained and they are made to work in uh, poor low-income countries to take care of their problems as well as uh, impart knowledge. So what is global health? It, it, is, uh, it necessarily means worldwide improvement of health, reduction of disparities. This is the most important because there is a wide disparity between developed nations and developing nations. The Western countries mostly talk about uh, African countries, but we in India also know that within India, there is a lot of disparity which exists between a, a, a type A city as well as, as compared to the villages. Then protection against global threats, like I said, the war and pandemic, etc. And most important is disregarding national borders, meaning that we should be able to provide health across the national border to the nations which are poorer and which need help. So shouldn't access to life-saving surgical treatment be a human right for everyone? Of course. The neglected stepchild surgery, her forgotten sister anesthesia, and the millions of surgical patients, they have finally made it onto the global health stage and into the global consciousness. In 2015, World Health Assembly adopted a resolution which said, Strengthening emergency and essential surgical care and anesthesia as a component of universal health coverage is the need of the hour. So these, uh, that is why the public health has to, um, the global health has to see the which are arising because of health care. If you see here, global surgery and anesthesia, we need a public health policy. We need access in terms of finances, the capacity and culture. And we also need to deliver safe and effective quality care. All this can only provide equitable care globally if we also invest in a lot of research, advocate quality care, educate the people and continue education and improve their existing infrastructure. So focus should be on medical education, mentorship. Public health awareness has to be made about safety of surgery and anesthesia. There needs to be more research, more publications, so that people in far-flung areas are able to access those researches. It has to be a bi-directional collaboration between a 
well to do nation as well as not so well to do nation with ethical consideration expanding global health awareness for equity and access the highlight here is equity and access and improve the skill set of medical providers in low income countries like i was reading that in bhutan today there are just four or five qualified anesthesiologists for delivering anesthesia care to the entire country so we need to improve we need to train more people and improve that set more coming to global health if we do not think locally then i think we have not done justice to this topic so what is the statistics in india not very great is what i should say anesthesiology as a medical practice is still lacking because we have just about 1.27 physician anesthesiologists per lakh population in india so what is the need of the r as dr mukul had uh, put across in one of his articles in 2019 training more and more non physician anesthesia providers is the need of the r how it can help is we can find more people the train duration we can train them to provide safe anesthesia so at, at least the community health centers can be uh, empowered with better anesthesia services and better Uh, so the obstetrics and surgical uh, system over there can become a little more safe we need to have continuing medical educations with didactic and practical lessons so that we can upgrade our skills and keep our skills upgraded the most important thing in india we talk about is access to 24/7 electricity and running potable water sitting in delhi probably or in metro cities we do not realize the importance of these two aspects but no healthcare system can be safe unless we have electricity and running water then operating room equipment i have heard of stories where people are being operated upon dining tables under a small table light equipment is not really being autoclaved but just being sprayed with some spirit and things are still happening like that in villages we need to work on those things <laughs> i'm sorry yeah then after then after the infrastructure we also need to ensure that medication and safe iv fluids are available which includes opioids as i understand opioids uh, procurement of opioids can be a big challenge in the hinterlands of the country other drugs too similarly medical gases there are many places which do not have oxygen supply do not have nitrous oxide supply though i suppose that after covid 19 and after what we saw during the second wave of the pandemic the supply of oxygen has become much much better in a lot of places with uh, installation of liquid gas plants etc monitoring this again is uh, almost non existent in a lot of uh, community health centers or a smaller centers in villages where definitely ecg may not be available pulse oximeter again now now has become uh, more available more accessible for patients capnogram uh even in a far flung if you as you keep going away from delhi you will find that even capnogram becomes a challenge conduct of anesthesia we need to ensure that there are qualified anesthesia providers their skills need to be constantly upgraded they need to undergo refresher courses they need to learn new things and they need to upkeep uh, their skills because there could be somebody who's placed in a uh, uh, in a city or in a village where there is not much happening that particular anesthesiologist is likely to Uh, get rested as far as his skills are concerned uh thank you so much thank you dr shalu uh, so dr shalu has covered this topic very well and uh, she has given a lot of perspective to different health issues which are there across the world and they are going to affect us all dr shalu can you uh, unshare your screen yes sir i am just trying to do that thank you uh, so uh, apart from this i would like to add uh, two or three points before we go to the next speaker uh, one is the uh, she talked about organ transplant now the problem which is coming is people who have had organ transplant now they are coming for incidental surgeries especially people who got uh, uh, left ventricular assist devices people who have had lung transplant they are coming for and they are a big challenge also which is going to come up in a big way in the near future secondly she talked about oncology now oncology is developing multiple verticals because the numbers are increasing so much that you got multiple verticals in oncology itself third is lifestyle uh, surgery is increasing in the geriatric age group i got a tkr done in a person bilateral tkr done in a person who is 95 years of age and i have heard that uh, somebody has done a tkr in a person who is 100 years of age 
So just imagine lifestyle surgeries are coming up at such late ages. So how things are going to be, so challenges are going to be great. The global issue, health issues are going to be quite a bit in the near future and we have to be prepared for that. Thank you, Dr. Shalu. Thank you once again. So we move to the next topic of the day. And the next topic is uh, how anesthesia is changing. What are the new perspectives in anesthesia, how things are changing? And to present that topic, we have Dr. Uh, Raki Goel. And Raki, uh, again, is from again from the armed forces background. Uh, she was uh, in the armed forces in the army, where she picked up uh, pediatric anesthesiology as a choice of uh, you know, subspeciality. She work, has work, been working exclusively in pediatric anesthesiology for quite some time. And currently, she is heading the department uh, of pediatric anesthesiology in the Rainbow Hospitals in Delhi. And in addition, she has also got into an administrative role as the clinical uh, director of, uh, again, another hospital uh, which belongs to the same group. Uh, Dr. Rakhi uh, is, uh, uh, is doing a lot of work in pediatric anesthesia, especially. Um, but I, I invited her to talk about something which is happening in the world because she's quite well informed and she's aware of what is happening to various things in the uh, world and because she travels a lot also that is another reason she knows a lot about things she has, uh, visits uh, hospitals across the world so she has an idea about changing perspectives in anesthesiology over to dr raki thank you sir uh, thank you so much uh, sir and ica for giving me this topic because this is really close to my heart and today I would actually be speaking from my heart. Uh, in all these years uh, that I've spent in the theater, I have seen how uh, the perspective towards anesthesia delivery has changed. And I would say it's certainly a very positive change for us, for the patients and for the environment. So uh, what I noticed in, uh, the in totality, if we see, it's the approach. Science remains the same, but our approach to clinical care, to patient care has really, really changed and it is changing every single day. It's become more collaborative. We collaborate more with surgeons, with other specialities, with uh, ICUs, with radiology, pathology, you know, every specialty. It's user-centered because uh, you know, we need to be comfortable, our patients need to be comfortable. It's totally evidence-based, though there is a lot of room for experimental uh, research and it is innovative. The, we constantly innovate and improve. So in a word, if we have to say, I think it is the approach towards clinical care, which uh, is the changing perspective. And I would run you through how uh, this, how what I mean is. So broadly, if we see, if we have to sum up this changing perspective, I would put these six things uh, as headings. One is ERAS, uh, enhanced recovery after surgery. Uh, green OT, the concept of perioperative surgical home. Uh, a lot of importance on communication and soft skills that pertains particularly to our country and our uh, grooming and uh, clinical practice. Then human resource management, another extremely important uh, aspect that uh, is changing and has changed a lot. And of course, the equipment and technology. So, so let's see. Uh, uh, talk about ERAS. You, I'm sure all of you are aware and you're practicing ERAS that started way back in 1997. It started with colorectal surgeries, but now I don't think there is any kind of any subspeciality of surgery where ERAS is not there. There's ERAS society and they have all subheads. E every single subhead is covered. Each subspeciality is uh, has figured out how to have an enhanced recovery after surgery. And anesthesia is, has plays a very big role in making ERAS happen. As you know, these are the basic steps of ERAS. It starts from the OPD, then to the PSE clinic, then the 
pre-operative area, the recovery room, the intra-op, of course, and the recovery room, then the inpatient hospital stay and the discharge and immediately thereafter. So when we see the anesthesia part of it, here on the left, sorry, sorry about that. So uh, we see in the blue, it's the optimization and the prehabilitation. How well we prepare a patient for the impending surgery. That includes nutrition, optimization of various other comorbidities, uh, mindset, you know, how a whole lot of anxiety is there. How do we work on various factors to prepare the patient for surgery so that he or she may not feel the stress of surgery as earlier. A lot about bowel preparation. Uh, I would emphasize on the fasting guidelines. I think that's changed dramatically and it affects more uh, in the pediatric age group. And we, my practice has changed totally about the NPO guidelines. There are nations uh, uh, who have been practicing for more than a decade, they've been practicing very reduced fasting uh, in children, also in adults. And uh, there's been absolutely zero major um, aspiration uh, you know, cases. So uh, a relook into fasting, uh, reduced fasting, a deliberate uh, move to reduce the fasting of preoperative fasting of the patients is something which could change uh, uh, outcomes in a very big way. We can also have carbohydrate loading uh, apart from reduced fasting to, to have an overall better physiological status. And then we all know that uh, surgery has become minimally invasive. And I always say our anesthesia should also be minimally invasive. We should see how minimally invasive can we go without compromising safety. Fluid balance is important. Normothermia is important. The kind of drugs we give, short acting, long acting, what is required, what is, uh, why don't we have a multimodal uh, opioid sparing analgesia um, plan for a particular surgery? How about a good PONV prophylaxis? Uh, don't use drugs that may enhance PONV in a high risk uh, for PONV patient then um, take care not just of the pre-op nutrition, but a post-op nutrition as well. Early ambulation is extremely important, we know. So, so a lot of change has occurred you know, from uh, a, a prolonged fasting to early feeding, like in all breastfeed babies, except for those who undergo uh, gut handling, we start breastfeeding right in our recovery room every single child and uh, there's absolutely no problem. Another small thing for us, but a very big thing for the patient is a nasogastric tube. Now we've really uh, tried hard to stop putting NGs wherever possible. Again, I would say where really indicated, go ahead and do it, but then you'll realize a lot many situations when you can do without it. Then early removal of catheters and drains. In fact, uh, think again when you put a when you ask them to put a Foley's catheter, like in elderly for uh, hip and knee replacement, we stopped putting urinary catheters a long time back, and then we realized then uh, and why we did it because the surgeons told us uh, if you give epidurals, we put the epidural uh, we put the Foley's catheter. Now you know one thing leads to another. So we stopped putting epidural catheters. We moved on to peripheral nerve blocks and they, uh, you know, the, the, the Foley's catheter, the urinary catheters were done away. So that was a step ahead. So small things like that make a huge difference. Now the discharge criteria, be it from your theater, be it from your recovery room, be it from the hospital, a, a relook is uh, welcome. You should see what is safe and what is reasonable. As I was saying that uh, perioperative fasting is important and minimize the NPO. In fact, encourage uh, consumption of clear fluids in, in most cases, unless there is a risk of delayed gastric emptying. 
So basically you have to tailor, uh, follow the guidelines, but do a bit of tailoring according to the patient and according to the surgery. You know, not all patients need the same kind of uh, uh, strict NPO. You can always give clear fluids, insist on giving clear fluids two hours or one hour before surgery as per the um, country's guidelines. Uh, and I said about early post-op feeding, so that's already explained. Now, the role of ultrasound here is extremely important. And for last uh, more than a year, we've started doing it. And we realized that a lot of times uh, there is ambiguity. The patients don't know exactly when they had the last uh, solid or, or liquid. So you, we can do a quick recheck by just putting a probe and looking at the stomach. Uh, it may or may not confirm uh, an empty stomach, but it will certainly show a full stomach. Now, ultrasound has been uh, a game changer. The ultrasound guidance in anesthesia has been, uh, I would say, limitless from head to toe. Earlier, what we think it would be used for just vascular access, now it can be used for a whole lot of nerve blocks, vascular access, um, um, uh, gastric emptying, nerve sheet diameter, uh, airway scanning, uh, lung scanning, echocardiography. I mean, um, seeing is believing. And even for our caudals, for our epidurals, for our spinals, the list is endless. And we should always, uh, that, that's the change we have seen. Uh, in my own practice, I've seen, I do not like to do a blind procedure. So I would like to see and do procedures. Now coming to sterility and infection control. I think it's this, this part has seen a major change, especially in our country, at least in bigger centers and institutes. I, I've, can't uh, vouch for the whole country, but yes, other places also things are changing and it's our, uh, it's on us to make that happen. As Dr. Shalu said, a lot has to go from metros to the periphery. So about OT sterility, about the concept of zoning in the OT, about deep cleaning of the OT, about knowing how many air changes are really required. Uh, the insisting on having a laminar flow in your theater, insisting on HEPA filters, periodic validation, and not just putting those filters and uh, those laminar flows, you need to validate them. Um, uh, and NABH is doing a great job in putting uh, um, checks and balances on how frequently you should validate, how you should validate, who should validate, you know, and uh, the old uh, time concept of formalin um, fumigation, that's all gone. And we all thank uh, people who stopped that uh, annoying fumigation uh, of by formalin in our theaters. You know, so the concept has changed. If you have good air changes, we've seen in COVID times, with good air changes, even uh, uh, a negative uh, pressure OTs were not required. We never had negative pressure OTs for uh, most of our theaters, I would vouch, and there was no spread. So, uh, so a lot has changed and uh, we should uh, spread this awareness to places where it is not changed or it's not changed enough. Another important thing is the CSSD protocols. Now, earlier times, if I remember, it was all stuff going into the autoclave and coming out of the autoclave, and we thought they were sterile. Now, uh, for those who handle CSSD, who uh, supervise CSSD would know, every single process, like uh, does the autoclave uh, is fully vacuumed, if there's air, then steam won't take place. So have you put a bovidic test or, or something equivalent? Have, have you challenged each and every process of sterilization or not? Till the pack is opened on the OT trolley, there is the last indicator that you need to see. So there's, it's a long process, it requires money, but we all know that it is required. Another important aspect, uh, which has not really come to our country, is the perioperative surgical home. Now, when we go to a hospital, say a big hospital, even I feel lost. If I go as a patient, I feel totally lost. 
where should I go? What should I do? It's, it's a mess. So perioperative surgical homes are uh, designed uh, to cater for the entire surgical episode, right from the decision to, uh, to operate, to everything, surgical, diagnostic, therapeutic, to discharge, and even after that, the follow-ups. So the main features are it's patient-centric. It's designed to ease the uh, patient troubles. It's physician-led, and it involves all the various uh, disciplines of healthcare, and it's a team-based thing. So ultimately, the aim is to reduce the cost, give more value to the patient, and uh, improve the delivery of healthcare, more quality to the healthcare system. So, so these are the basic um, engagements of the concept of periop surgical home. Uh, the concept started in 2011 in the US and in 2015, it was presented in the annual meeting of the anesthesiology. And since then, a whole lot of institutes in the US have uh, started this concept of perioperative surgical homes, including uh, geriatric centers, pediatric centers. So uh, these numbers are increasing. So this, uh, this spans through pre-op to recovery, long-term recovery. And uh, uh, it involves not just uh, us, that's clinicians, it involves the entire uh, healthcare system, uh, right from supply chain, the operational uh, people, the nursing, human resources, social services, the IT, the pharmacy, the lab, the central supply, radiology. I mean, it's, it's really multidisciplinary. So one team that consists of all the health works together towards uh, making the patient safe and comfortable and uh, decrease the cost of healthcare. So there is a lo lot of overlap, but the center of this is the surgical patient. If you read articles on it, you'll realize what I'm trying to say. And this concept sooner or later will be adopted in most of our multi-speciality big institutes. Another very important, and uh, uh, I, I think a lot of institutes support this, they're certified as green OTs. So what is green OT? Um, as I said, the air flows, the air changes uh, should be a minimum standard. The, when you use the inhalational uh, anesthetics, why don't you use low flows, minimal flows? To first choose the right, right anesthetic, then use very low flows. Uh, you should have a scavenging system so that uh, it doesn't go to the environment. Then you should even have good filling system of uh, these uh, anesthetics into the vaporizers. And uh, you should be very uh, mindful of how the biomedical base of your theater is getting disposed. There are infection control measures that should be strictly and very strictly adhered to, and there should be checks and balances to make sure it happens. Heat and humidity control is part of it and a relook into the reusable items. Not everything should be thrown away. There should be a real look into what we can safely reuse. So all this uh, comprises of green OT and uh, there are validations for institutes or theaters that have been declared green. And now comes the man and the machine. I, I think this is uh, always gonna be a tricky thing we as anesthetists, we work with so much of technology machines, but uh, human factor is a very, very important part in all this. Uh, when it comes to machines, we have equipment, we have drugs, we have the technology, we have the research that is going on to improve that. We also have artificial intelligence coming in, in a very big way. And, um, uh, but it all depends. Is it available to you? What is the cost? Can you buy it? And what are the after sale services? Can that uh, equipment be upgraded to the next one? Like uh, your phones, 
you know, promptly you upgrade to the next version. But can your machine, can your OD light, can, can your monitors be upgraded to a better version uh, with the cost that you can bear? So, um, so these days, yes, mostly the answer is yes. But then again, as Dr. Shalu says, it's more in the metros. It has to go to the periphery in our country. Now, monitoring also. It's, there has been an amazing change when it comes to monitoring, from holding the pulse to coming to advanced monitoring systems uh, these days. It's extensive and it's very specific. Most of it is non-invasive. The endeavor is to make it uh, non-invasive from all the invasive kind of monitoring that we had earlier. There's a whole lot of default setting. Uh, there are safe limits that you can put in monitors. You can customize options. You can have fail-safe mechanisms. So I think we have been able to add a lot of safety factor to our practice in the theaters and the ICUs. Now coming to the human factor, I think this is extremely important that um, uh, there is an um, awareness of this and there is a change. You see the younger generation uh, demands, um, you know, uh, working hours should not exceed. Uh, the working conditions should be good. They demand all this and why not? Uh, a team concept, you know, a, a good working environment, Everybody needs moral support. You, you've had a bad day, you've had a tough case, it didn't go well as planned. You need moral support. There is no blame game. There should be safe reporting. A lot of institutes are practicing. You, know, you can have, uh, you don't have to write your name and uh, you could report errors. There are several softwares where you can report errors and um, you can have an audit on it. You can have a meeting where uh, there is no blame. People don't report errors because they'll be blamed. There will be a stigma on it. So the change is that it's become more acceptable. Human factors, human errors, um, the, the approach towards human errors has changed. And, um, and on the, uh, you know, as an additional thing, we have professional indemnity to save us, especially in our field. We have uh, medical council re uh, registrations and a periodic uh, renewals. So, so these are checks and balances that are in place in most places. So uh, coming to this man and machine thing again, the checklists, uh, as we know, for everything we have checklists and um, we have drug handling systems we have uh, protocols, we have hospital information management system. I think a lot of institutes now have uh, these changes, uh, these systems. And we have uh, committees uh, that um, uh, you know, help you deal with stress. So uh, these things have been there in the West for some time, but they have reached our country and we are evolving very fast. Um, I feel that uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I apologize in advance to say that our grooming uh, right from our MBBS days need uh, more uh, focus on soft skills because they really matter in our professional life. It needs to be taught. We need to be taught and uh, things are changing. Now medical colleges have this as, a, uh, as part of their curriculum where they teach you how to talk to your colleagues, how to talk to a patient, how to talk to a patient's relative, how to break bad news. You know, these are extremely important. You may be great clinically, but if you do not have soft skills, you stand nowhere and rightly so. So these things are evolving, uh, changing in our country. And uh, I think there should be a lot of emphasis on these soft skills. Another thing that I noticed um, in our country is the access to literature. With the internet available, with a lot of uh, sites giving free access, with a lot of uh, institutes subscribing to several journals and books and um, sites, uh, you, you can access everything that somebody in um, the West can. There are a lot of uh, training simulation training, the structured programs for training, the hands-on workshops. 
So, and, and they're everywhere. Right now, we are part of one of them. So uh, the societies are doing a great job. So, you know, we have access, we can improve. And another thing is uh, when it comes to an individual, I think we all uh, think of self. So uh, the need for professional development was undervalued earlier, but now um, people want promotion, empowerment, reward, growth, and why not? So it gives you a lot of motivation uh, to do work. So, so people have started thinking on their professional development, which is a huge positive change and we should all support it. And last but not least, safety and safety has been always the hallmark of uh, anesthesia clinical care. And it's, we all have safety as a team goal. So the take home message from my side is evolve, always evolve, keep updating your clinical practice, always uh, have an introspection into your clinical practice that how we can improve, how we can make the patients comfortable, our colleagues comfortable, our team comfortable and happy and provide a very safe care to our patients. So that's all from my side. And thank you once again for giving me this topic and uh, thank you for your patient yeah, listening. Thank you. Thank you, Rocky, for uh, extensive coverage of the topic. It was great. And I, I was very happy that you brought out the concept of uh, how single use is going to go away in the near future. And that is how it is. You know, when we talked about environmental protection, we suddenly realized that we have been promoting single use items mainly, especially in the operating rooms. And uh, now with it is uh, come, people have come to realize that we are causing a lot of plastic waste. We are causing a lot of damage to the environment because of our single use. And we are going back to multiple use. That is a very important message which I, I could get from your talk, apart from other messages. I'm not saying that you didn't uh, give other important messages, but it was basically this particular message, which I wanted to emphasize on people. And uh, also you brought out about uh, surgical homes. I'll be talking a little bit about education for surgical homes. So there'll be a little inter uh, sort of overlap between your talk and my talk. So uh, uh, with that, I come to uh, the third talk, uh, which I will be uh, talking, uh, something I'll be talking about. And it's one of my favorite topics. And that is why probably Dr. Uh, Radha Krishnan felt that I should talk about it. And the uh, talk is on anesthesia education. What are the forthcoming changes and what more is needed? Anesthesia education has been, um, you know, sort of static for many years. Everybody has been talking about the same thing, same doing the same things in education. And as a result, the person who passes out of an, uh, after MD or a DNB doesn't know what is his future. He doesn't know whether to go this side or that side or whether to take a subspeciality, super speciality. But remember, anesthesiology has a bright future ahead. Whatever path you take, whatever way you go, you've got a bright future ahead. And this is how anesthesiology uh, education was talked about in 1926. This is a publication from Anesthesia and Algesia from 1926, uh, which talked about undergraduate and postgraduate instructions in anesthesiology and how they felt that we an anesthesiologists should be aware of various systems, be aware of various things, not just give drops of ether to a patient because that was the system then ether used to put on the shimmel bush mask. And then they said, no, it's, we must review and understand various systems and try to become physicians rather than just technicians. And this was 1926. And the person who wrote this article was, was Flag, the man who was famous for his flag can. So what is anesthesia education today? See, there have been a, there's been a major transformation in anesthesiology education in the recent past only. And this is uh, causing a major paradigm shift in the teaching methodology of anesthesiology. Though the need for reform was long-standing, the reforms have started only now. It was a path correction, which was the need of the hour in many areas. And the entire, actually, if you see the entire medical field is getting a relook and everybody's relooking at how medical education should take place. And of course, with the evolution of a lot of new technology, a lot of new knowledge, and 
things have changed, but what is still lacking in anesthesiology and all medical field teaching is the lack of training in vital areas of a lot of things. The basic problem which has been highlighted by lots of authors is that we are still living in a time-based system in which we have teaching programs, a defined number of lectures or demonstrations based on the length of time. And we assume that students will develop the requisite competencies to practice after that specific time. After five years of MBBS, you can do it. After three years of uh, MD, you can do this. So it's an assumption which is possibly not correct. No specific curriculum till date has been prescribed for practical skill development. And there is no way of assessing practical skills at exit examinations. What you do is just uh, examine the student for uh, thing like examination of the patient. Like, a, like in an SE exam, we present a case of uh, with cardiovascular disease or respiratory disease or endocrine disease, examining the patient, but we actually do not practice anesthesiology in the exit examination. So what are the changes which are underway in anesthesia education? I wrote this editorial uh, just about uh, a year back and we talked about competency-based education, a welcome step. This is a welcome step which the Medical Council of India uh, took in 2018 and it was implemented in 2019 onwards. And this was implemented basically for MBBS students. Now, the same CBC is going to be implemented in the next few years by the National Medical Commission for post graduation So what is competency-based curriculum? It's a curriculum which is based on the principle that the competence must be demonstrated and documented rather assumed through the time spent in the teaching program. So you have to document and demonstrate the competence. This CBC defines the teaching requirements for each stage of training and specifies the mode of evaluation. So unlike earlier where you used to have just exit exam, one theory exam followed by a practical, now it's a, going to be a continuous assessment in which each particular milestone has to be covered and there'll be an assessment of each milestone. This will enable identification of the student's strengths and weaknesses and implementation you know, remedial measures in case the person is unable to achieve the right amount of competence in that particular field, remedial measures can be taken during the training piece. So tailored learning is being implemented to accelerate learning and progression of new skills and knowledge. The CBC is designed to prepare students for independent practice and to serve as a transition from learning to clinical practice, which was not there earlier. It was earlier I've, I've seen lots of people who are excellent academic, uh, in academics during their MD, on, but they failed when it came to practical work because practical work was not taught in the correct manner earlier. It was assumed that if somebody has been working in anesthesiology for three years, the person is competent enough to deliver anesthesia, which was possibly a wrong assumption. So today, the clinical assessment and practical assessment is moving away to what is called an OSCE's obstruct, objective structure competency evaluation. But is it com enough? No. I'll talk about it later in my talk. The NBE is trying to implement competency-based education even in physiology. Now, they're trying to start the process and uh, they're trying to develop a curriculum for CBC in physiology. And this is expected to be based on multiple assessments during your post graduation course, not one assessment at the end of the course, but multiple assessments during the course. However, this particular proposal has no proposal, there's no proposal to include skill assessment and skill as you as is assumed to be acquired during this time based together. What is the education system currently being followed by other countries? If you look at the American system, the American system is controlled by the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, what is called as the ACGME. It is already in the transition mode from time-based system to a competency-based education system. They have based it on a learner-centered approach that emphasizes on achieving specific outcomes called as milestones. 
the acgme milestone project was designed basically to identify behaviors and attributes that constitute the essential competencies for their specialty so this is a common program which is running for all specialties together now the fundamental assumption in our specialty is that skill sets and knowledge required to provide safe and effective anesthesia can be broken down into subsets called as milestones as per the american system they have developed milestones the milestones are subsets of six general competencies each needs to be identified and measured so education leaders in america have identified 25 milestones for anesthesiology and have framed each milestone in the context of developing a continuum from a novice to an expert and it is expected that progression through the milestones will lead to overall proficiency in this specialty now the cbc residency education differs from the traditional time and training model because it defines it is defined by outcomes rather than the number of encounters right now if you look at a curriculum it says you have to give 100 spinals different depending on the curriculum of different universities 100 spinals 100 epidurals 100 cbc line or uh, cbc lines etc now they are coming out of that number based encounters to outcomes of the procedure which you have done the cbc education relies on the notion that with specific measurable outcomes the subjective nature of assessment prevalent in traditional education program is replaced with discrete transparent achievable objectives for a resident to meet there's a renewed emphasis on a central theme of progressing through a residency with attainment of an ever increasing level of knowledge and skill and this is what has been described as the miller's pyramid of assessment they say that you need to the trainee needs to climb up this pyramid to reach uh, to finally reach the practice practicing physician stage which is and he becomes an expert in the specialty while after achieving all these milestones so he starts from a novice to an advanced beginner to a competent person to a proficient person and finally becomes an expert in the specialty now how do we assess the people in cbc the competency based education is particularly suited to assess discrete procedural skills like you can assess a person for intubation line placement because of the its focus on individual and attainable patient skills if the opportunity did not present itself in clinical settings simulation must fill the gap as per the cbc guidelines this competency based training and learning could assure that a resident from any program would have a consistent comparable and a meaningful experience so what but what are the changes still needed and what are the changes which are required for the future the cbc is lacking in lots of things the cbc lacks in assessing a person for non technical skills such as judgment and decision making which is a very important part especially in as far as anesthesiology is concerned and the faults in the cbc lines is very clearly demonstrated by this study which was conducted in america in multiple centers what they did was they assessed 301 residents of four medical schools and they were evaluated by the cbc program and when they had the patients uh, evaluated in clinical settings they got a particular results after that what they did was they assessed the same students on simulators when they gave them situations and asked them to perform on the simulators and they found that only two, less than 2% of the residents could clear the exam when they went to the simulators that means the problem Uh, is still there despite the cbc you still got a problem that though they have faced the competency based examinations they are still failing when you send them into a simulated environment so that is why there is now uh, they are feeling that there is need to assess outcomes rather than anything else there is a need for an outcome based assessment the outcome based assessment relies on trained observers and performance based assessment measures of individual specific skills demonstrable or demonstrated in persons the challenge is to find the right assessment tool for this so how do we examine them how do we the best option is to 
to use simulators in examination and make the person demonstrate in a situation in a simulator rather than you know uh, have an assessment based on oscis so there's a requirement of a lifelong learning uh, which is required and a long term relationship between the evaluator and the trainee the assessment tools must not only recognize individual pieces but must aggregate them into recognizable complete high definition pictures that de defines true multifaceted competency of that facility it promotes individual achievements by the learner rather than focusing on the amount of time to achieve a particular milestone and the final thing should be the assessor has to ask himself do i trust this trainee to perform this task independently that is one of the most important things do i trust can i leave this person to go into the environment and practice independently that is something very important which is there today uh, examinations are passed saying that no this person is very knowledgeable he needs to be clear he will practice very well but that is something which is uh, now we are thinking again uh, we have to think again whether this competent competence with the person is got is trustworthy can this person deliver in the environment outside in the practice setting now another advantage which the they are saying which the cbc can give us that we do not have a time based kind of program that the person has to be trained for 3 years or 5 years depending on the program they say that if a person develops these competencies earlier than 3 years or 2 years whatever is the time prescribed the person will be cleared as a specialist so this is something very important and to overcome uh, and to ensure that the person develops better competence what has been permitted by many universities is called as moonlighting what do you mean by moonlighting moonlighting means like you've got a trainee in your institute but you feel that the per, uh, trainee needs more practical work needs to understand more he is permitted to work wherever he feels like in his spare time not to it during his training time in his spare time the supposing we got a training schedule with which the trainee has to be in the hospital 8 hours a day in the balance 16 hours that person is permitted to go and work anywhere in a private setup anywhere he feels like so this is called moonlighting if he wants if he gets paid for it that's also permitted so that is something which has been permitted by many universities in, in the united states that they permit moonlighting so a person who is studying in regular programs is allowed to work outside in the evening basically they say that this helps in developing better skills because the person is working independently in setups and so they feel that person who has moonlighted become more robust and is more tailored to handle the environment outside plus in the future rakhi talked about artificial intelligence so now there's a time that we should remember to marry artificial artificial intelligence and our training right now we feel that the robots will perform anesthesia in the future and we are scared of uh, robots no but uh, we should not be scared of robots but we should rather embrace them we should start working them develop and help develop programs of artificial intelligence give our inputs into artificial intelligence get trained into giving inputs into artificial intelligence so that artificial intelligence helps and helps us in working in the near future so remember always as rakhi also pointed out artificial intelligence is very good to perform repetitive tasks and it is very good in such tasks because supposing you are giving uh, the same amount of uh, putting a pass in the endotracheal tube or you being repetitively the artificial intelligence will be able to do it but what the artificial intelligence lacks is the response to a situation that is where it responds every patient is different so that is why we need to marry artificial intelligence in such a way that we improve through artificial intelligence and make our life easier it is not to make our lives difficult but artificial intelligence should be managed in such a way that we make our life easier the other thing which needs training is which is lacking in most of our training institution is the training on perioperative medicine remember perioperative medicine has been talked about 
from quite some time we have been talking about peri operative medicine somehow it is not entering our training we have to enter peri operative medicine uh, we have to get peri operative medicine into our training schedules we have to train uh, our people into a multifaceted ways of managing patient not just talking about anesthesiology and basic critical care we have to get into peri operative medicine because this is something very important and this has been recognized in a vision document even by the royal college of anesthetists of uk and they said that unless we reengage with the wards to provide care before and after surgery we will lose relevance so the our training has to go into peri operative medicine the same has been accepted by the american college of peri operative medicine which says we should transform transform the way care is delivered to the peri operative continuum by breaking down the silos in our healthcare system so this is another part of training which needs to be changed araki also talked about peri operative surgical homes again this is the future i know of lots of people who are getting into peri operative surgical homes and when the problem is they are not been trained to run as peri operative surgical homes as raki pointed out what are the steps of a peri operative surgical home it is time that we understand peri what is peri operative homes we have to remember the surgeon is basically trained to do surgery he is actually not trained in peri operatively managing the patient so it is basically peri operative surgical home is an extension of peri operative medicine so it is time that we that we start looking at peri operative home surgical homes in a training schedule itself peri operative surgical homes uh, involves surgery is one your part of peri operative surgical homes and this these two are the only events in which the surgeon should be responsible otherwise the scheduling to the pre op optimization the post operative care and the transitional care has to go down to the anesthesiology community so it's very important that we understand this it's a wonderful uh, you know diagram which was published in 2020 in the anesthesiology journal which talks about the coordinated system of peri operative care in which if you look at this all if you look at the journal article you'll see that the surgeon has no role in the surgery apart from actually cutting the patient so that's all i uh, finish with this uh, this and let's uh, we'll now take questions faraz has not put up any questions up till now faraz are there any questions uh, for our, for the panelists uh, sir uh, till there there was no question but i am checking again sir give me a moment will be get questions on case questions are coming uh, let me again uh, thank ica for giving us the opportunity to conduct this webinar i think it's a topic uh, which is not talked about we talk about things which are generally not discussed by in webinars and uh, i'm sure uh, the people i don't know how many people witnessed the webinar but they will benefit they'll get new ideas we have put some seeds for of thought into people's minds i hope uh they carry it further talk more about it do more to improve things in anesthesiology because we have to look at the future we have to look at how things are going to be in the future and it is time that we think about this and improve ourselves or modify our training modify the way we look at things sir i think they, i have a suggestion Yes. We should have uh, questions during our uh, PG on this topic uh, in our MD exam, in our DNB exam. Uh, the moment you put a question, or in the viva, if you know, uh, students are asked, "What do they think about global health issue? What do, What do you think about this?" Uh, then they will have a deliberate uh, uh, attempt to understand the changing. world in the health can i add something to this uh, raki let me say something something which i noticed uh, we did a few webinar i've done a few webinars for ica and i found that 
soon after a webinar, about a month after a webinar, in the exam, there were questions based on a webinar. So that was a good, well, welcome thing which I saw. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, the, some examiners are also watching the webinar. Mm -hmm. They are taking up questions from our webinar also. And I'm sure people, uh, if they are attending, they'll, they would have benefited a lot from it. And I'm sure so the younger minds will have more ideas when we put up a question like this in the exam. They, they'll come up with uh, brilliant ideas that haven't been thought of uh, earlier. You're right. A young mind always has better ideas. Uh, we are probably getting rusted now. You've been there for quite some time. We're getting rusted and I think I, that is going to happen. Uh, for us, it informs me that there are no for the no questions from the delegates. Yes, sir. Delegate. We don't have received any questions from the delegates. So um, anyway, uh, I think uh, now that uh, we have completed our deliberations, I would request Dr. Kanchi Mulidhar to uh, uh, give a word of thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mukul Kapoor, the wonderful uh, seminar about the forthcoming challenges in anesthesia. This is the 114th ICA webinar. Well done. I am grateful to Shalu, Dr. Shalu Gar, who spoke about global health issues. Very well done again. And uh, uh, Raki Goel discussed several important points, starting from early recovery of uh, after anesthesia, use of ultrasound, infection control, monitoring, green OT. So many important points were discussed. And uh, ultimately, Mukul Kapoor men uh, spoke about anesthesia education how we can transform a novice into an expert, what are the steps involved, what is competency-based curriculum, and uh, how it can be implemented. And also I mentioned about um, outcome-based assessment, which is probably important uh, in the near future. And on behalf of ICA, I would like to thank all the three faculty, that is Dr. Mukul Kapoor, Dr. Shalu Garg and Dr. Raki Goen for having taken us through these important upcoming topics. And I would like to remind you that on uh, uh, during October, uh, not October, sorry, November 4th and 6th, we have the International ICA Meet in Chandigarh. Please join us. And uh, with this, I would like to thank the leadership of ICA for uh, continuing these educational activities. And uh, once again, uh, wish you good luck and uh, uh, good night till we meet again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mukul. Thank you, Raki. Thank, thank you, Shalu. You so much. Thank and you. thank you, the Clarinet team, for supporting this activity. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Sir, with all your permission, can we close the session? Yes, please. I think, okay, I think thank so. you. And uh, good night, everyone, and take care of yourself, everyone. Good night. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very thank you. Much. Thank you. Bye.